Peace and blessings everyone. Welcome to Spotlight on Medjuenka. And I want you to call your friends and tell them that um, we are streaming live on jtvlive.net. I want to say hello to two of my loyal viewers, Shanae James and her mom, Sherilyn Farrington, over there in Bellevue. So, uh, you know, thanks for watching. And I'm hoping to have you guys on the program, the young people on the program. And so if you want to come on and you want to talk about issues affecting young people, I want you to send me an email to jtvspotlight at yahoo.com and so we could get some young people on the program and talk about issues. I have two very special guests this evening, Ms. Lorna Dawson, she's a special, special education officer and uh, she's here with Dr. Louis Felix and he's going to, he's from Depends when, where I am when you ask me. <laughs> uh, part of the year, uh, I work in Jerusalem, Israel, mm -hmm. as a part of an international center mm -hmm. that is doing the work here in BVI, and part of the year in San Francisco, California. Okay, and he's here to facilitate a workshop uh, on the learning potential assessment device, or uh, the learning propensity assessment device. Um, acronym being LPAD and it's a procedure and a set of instruments enabling one to evaluate the learning process and identify an individual's cognitive functions, operations, and problem-solving strategies. And this is important because it's a different way of testing our children to find out their true propensity or their true potential so we can uh, intervene, cater to their needs. So parents you need to be paying close attention to this. So you keep it glued right here to Spotlight. We are going to be right back after these words from our sponsors. Don't go away. This program is sponsored by the law firm of J.S. Archibald & Co. and by the trust company J.S. Archibald Trust Services Limited, both of Rotown Tortola BVI. Welcome back to Spotlight. I want to introduce <coughs> my guests. So I want to first welcome the visitor. This is the first time you've been here? No, second time. Second time. You're no longer a visitor. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dr. Felix, welcome mm -hmm. to the BVI. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Great. And Sister Lana Dawson, it's good to see you. Thank you. Yes. You, with this thing from a long time, <laughs> I mean, cognitive thinking, trying to get us to understand the, the growth and development of, of human beings, particularly our young people. I remember years ago you had uh, Dr. Kanad here and trying to do a workshop and teach the, the children, initiate actually, mm -hmm. critical cognitive thinking, critical thinking in the school system. Mm -hmm. So you're at it again. Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> And what, what is this about this time? Why is Dr. Felix here? And what you're hoping to accomplish? Okay, first of all, good evening. Let me say that um, I don't feel badly about how long I've been persisting because the work that we've been doing is developed by Israeli psychologist, Dr. Ruben Feuerstein. And he started his work in the late 40s to 50s, and it's only in the 90s or 2000s that neuroscience began to really confirm what has, he's been saying. So now everybody's jumping on board the first sign wagon. So if it took him 40, 50 years, I don't consider 10 years a long time for me to be plodding away. <laughs> and we have been making gains as we went along the way. Um, Dr. Fala came as a result, um, I work in the school system and I met with the school counselors at one of their meetings and they said to me, Ms. Dawson, we need some help. We are having too many children with needs that we cannot meet, special educational needs, and we need some training. And we'd like you to do something with us on the next time we meet. Now when they meet, they usually just meet for 
a half a morning. So I'm thinking, okay, so what can I do in this short period of time that will help them to meet the needs of students? So I decided, you know, these are some new counselors. So let me do a presentation on Feuerstein's work. So I gave some background information, um, a bit of research on different places where the work has had an impact and the types of intervention that are provided, the cognitive intervention, or the, which is called um, instrumental enrichment, which is a set of tools that you use to help students develop their thinking. And I also introduced them to the learning propensity assessment device, which is a form of dynamic assessment, different from your traditional assessment where you end up with an IQ score and you send to say, well, okay, this is what this child is capable of doing. With the learning propensity assessment device, you're actually trying to find out what the child's propensity is for learning. So you're do using your different instruments, your different tools, and you're seeing where the child is deficient in their thinking, how the areas of strengths you know that they use to problem solve, and you're making note of that and coming out of that, and you're able to plan for how you will intervene with the child. So I presented and I said, well, would you like to learn how to do the assessment? And they said, sure, you know, we would, we would like to learn. So that started the ball rolling. I contacted Dr. Kinnad about training. He said, well, Lou is in the States right now, so maybe you need to contact him because he's really the one who's good with training, that sort of thing. So that spiraled a set of phone calls. And thankfully, we had just gotten um, the special ed budget. And factoring into that, I had included some training so we were able to pull it off. So hence, Dr. Fallick is here. Okay. And you're going to do a workshop, Dr. Fallick? We are actually um, three quarters of the way through it. Oh, okay. Uh, we're in the middle of our second week, <clears throat> and the participants who have been learning are now practicing. And we're at the end of this week, they will have finished uh, doing a practice assessment on uh, a group of children and um, they will be ready to move out into the the world of BVI and begin to do some of this assessment on the children who need it and to consult to work with the families the parents and the families and the teachers of the children whom they have assessed. Now when, when you talk about propensity to learn uh, if I'm interpreting the word propensity correctly, mm -hmm. you're speaking about one's ability and desire. Partially ability and desire, but primarily modifiability. The extent to which a learner, a person, can develop their learning under the proper conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, Lorna talked about conventional assessment, the IQ score. In conventional assessment, the interest is how much has a person learned at the point you test him, mm -hmm. and then a prediction of how much they will learn based on how much they have learned. We turn that around. We talk about cognitive modifiability, the ability to modify, to, to learn, and we think that that's a better uh, indicator of intelligence. Not how much you have learned, but how much you can learn under the proper conditions. And for us, the proper conditions is what we call mediated learning experience. All parents mediate their children. Sometimes poverty or uh, technology or um, the traumas of war and, 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 and uh, external events prevent that mediation. But it's the most natural thing in the world for a parent to want to transmit his or her culture and his or her personal experience. We want our children to be the manifestations of who we are. And so mediation is a very natural uh, experience. Uh, 
I want my children to uh, appreciate the world they're in. I want them to see and hear and feel uh, all the beauty and all of the uh, importance of the experience we have. Um, perhaps a good example of mediated learning experience is a, uh, a, a, a ceremonial meal that you have in your family that recognizes your culture. You know, we, everyone eats but to eat special foods and to talk about how these special foods have been eaten by our parents and our grandparents and so on. That's mediation. Mm. Now, the issue for... So teachable moments in the home. Absolutely. Teachable mm. moments in the home. I once sat in a restaurant and next to us, in the next table over, was a father and three children. And as the food came to the table, he talked to them about where do you think this food comes from? And how do you think it was prepared? And where have you had this before? And what does it remind you of? And he just talked to his children about the food that they were eating, the teachable moment. Mm -hmm. Now, the particular issue of concern for us is the special needs child or the family that's in crisis. Do they stop mediating? Do they give up? Do they start mediating? Well, either <laughs> they, they may not start, or they may stop. They, mm -hmm. may, they may say, okay, I've been told, or I see that my child doesn't seem to be paying attention, or that he has a, some kind of a hearing or a visual problem or a, a hyperactivity. So I stop mediating. And we say, that's the time when we have to bring a very special kind of mediated learning experience to the child to overcome and to strengthen their capacity to learn. Okay, now I, I just want to go back a little bit to, to, to the, the whole issue of parents mediating and stopping mediating. Mm -hmm. uh, you think that there are parents who are talking to their child about various cultural items mm -hmm. uh, and trying to transfer those mm -hmm. cultural items that at, some, at a certain point they say oh, my child is not learning this stuff and they just stop teaching them yes I do okay uh, yeah so yeah. Uh, so then and well if you if, if you don't have contact with that child you wouldn't you wouldn't know that you will see it in a variety of ways how do you how does it manifest um, in uh, a lack of interest and motivation in the world around them, mm -hmm. uh, in being unable or uninterested. In when I see a child who is unmotivated, I see a child who is acting unnaturally. My th uh, my then three-year-old granddaughter would go for a walk in the park with her mother and her grandparents, mm -hmm. and. The mother would see a small flower by the side of the path and would kneel down with that child and would talk to that child about the look at the color of the flower, look at the number of petals, let's see if there are others around here. And they would s s kneel down for 15 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And what she was building in that child, our granddaughter, who is now getting ready to go to university, she was building a sensitive, aware, focused, thinking child. When you see children who don't think, when you see children who are impulsive, who act out, they are often children who are who have not been sufficiently mediated for a variety of reasons. And especially the special needs kids that uh, that that we 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 have to we face and we deal with in our schools. Parents stop mediating. Okay, well, you're talking about special needs kids. I'm, I'm trying to get my mind around this. Mm -hmm. you're, trying to, you're talking about special needs kids that need medi mediating. It seems to me that here in this environment, mm -hmm. that either all the kids are special needs kids, or the parents don't, don't know how to mediate. Well, you're raising another issue in my mind, mm -hmm. and that is um, we see parents feeling like they don't have the right to mediate, that there's so much, there's so much um, stimulation, there's so much going on, there's so much technology 
There's so much on the television set. Mm -hmm. There's so much in the uh, in the in the uh, in the Game Boys and in the iPads and in the iPhones that uh, that um, seem to be independent of the the personal interaction. And what, so, so that so that's a problem. And can we change can we change the word uh, mediate into another word? Teaching. Teaching. Okay. Good. Because uh, you know. Interacting. Yeah, it could go. It could go over your head. Yeah, yeah. The word mediating mm -hmm. can go over your mm -hmm. head. Mm -hmm. So, so the the parents, the parents know having a child start to teach the child about the, its environment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that is important mm -hmm. because then the, you, you teach the child how to now examine things mm -hmm. for right. themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, um, Lana. I mean, this 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 is beginning to be a cultural thing now, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. and 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 you would have to, to 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 look take a look at this. Do you think, as a teacher and in, in the BBI, in your experience, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking about special needs children. I'm talking about the regular general population mm -hmm. of us, mm -hmm. me included, mm -hmm. that we go through that process of child development, early child development, with our children on a personal level. How many of us you think as parents go out with, for walks with our children and explain to them about the flowers and talk about the boats coming in and talk about the cattle in the street and talk about the chickens and how the mm -hmm. eggs are laid and you know all the things we see in our environment. You know mm -hmm. we might not go by, by the flowers, but certainly we got enough cows walking in the street. Mm -hmm. We got enough chickens crossing mm -hmm. the road. A lot of roosters. A lot of roosters. Well, I don't know where all the hens are, but <laughs> I see a lot hens. of roosters. Trust me, we got a lot of roosters. Got a lot of hens because they got to be born. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, do, we, do, we, do we go through that process or we just go, shh, shh get out of it, you know? <laughs> I don't think we go through it as much as we should. Mm -hmm. Some parents more than others, but you're finding less, of, less and less of it happening. You're finding children, I was um, watching a DVD with some shots from the BVI, and I asked the child was with me, so I said, an animal, wasn't it? What, what is that? And she said, a goat. It was actually a sheep, and I'm thinking, well, what child in the BVI doesn't know the difference between a sheep and a goat? But there it was, and this is a child who's doing very well in school, but her first reaction, she said it was a goat. And let me share with you another example. While I taught um, in primary school some years ago, I was doing a lesson on living things, and we, this one child stops, interrupted the class, and I shouldn't say interrupted, put up his hand and he said, well, teacher, I saw a camel in town today. So I said, you saw a camel? Where, where did you see a camel? In town, by the supermarket. So we had a little discussion in terms of, well, did you see a real camel? And different children had their inputs. One even said, um, Mr. Franklin up at Beef Island had some mini donkeys or something, mm -hmm. I don't know what you call them, Mi image, uh, uh, horses, miniature horses, horses, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. say, you showed what that wasn't what you saw? He said, no, it was in town. So I'm thinking, well, maybe it was right away. He said, right away. Maybe it was the one up at Porcelain and there was a donkey in there. He said, teacher, I know a donkey. I saw a camel. So when we got to the bottom of it, what he saw was a picture of a camel. A, cam a poster advertising camel cigarette on the door going into Rightway right supermarket. Mm -hmm. And there was a picture of a camel on it. So I basically, you know, glossed over and said, well, okay, yes, that was a picture of a camel, but it wasn't a real life camel here in Tortola. Mm -hmm. And I moved on with my lesson. Next thing I heard, another voice piped up. There ain't nothing if Tortola ain't have camel. I know Santa must have lion and tiger. So I said, why do you say St. Thomas has lion and tigers? He said, because I see them on Channel 12. And mm. so I discussed, but it's after I began to learn about, you know, this whole issue of the interaction with your child and discussing and mediating and that sort of thing. Then is when I realized that as a teacher, I should have gone a bit further when I said, well, it was a picture of the camel, I needed to ask some more questions. Well, where else do we see, what, what other situations do we have where we see representations of things that are alive, but they're not actually there in our presence for us to touch? Mm -hmm. And then you can talk about, you see things on book, you see them on television, you see them at the movies and that sort of thing. So that would have widened the scope from just Understanding and that that particular poster was not a camel, you sort of transcend, you know. They have a different frame of reference, right? 
Okay. <laughs> That's deep. We have to take a break. And we're going to come back and continue the discussion because, I mean, I, I had no idea mm -hmm. that this, you know, this, this is so interesting. So I'm going to try to, I'm, I'm going to learn this stuff myself. I'm, gonna, I'm <laughs> doing this workshop right now, so we're going to learn this thing. I'm, I'm going to do this. Keep it locked right here. We, we, you have, to, you have to, uh, to stay tuned to this conversation. This is very, very important. We'll be right back after these words of our sponsors. Spotlight is brought to you by CCT Global Communication, Data Pro, Orion Law, Clarence Thomas Limited, Virgin Island Motors, and Bolo's Wholesale Cash and Carry. Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm Edge Wayne. I'm here with Dr. Felic, Felic, and Lorna Dawson. And Dr. Felic is here to conduct a workshop on learning potential or propensity assessment device, which is a series of instruments learn, um, used to, to measure learning uh, abilities. And cognitive thinking and problem-solving skills. But we, you know, <laughs> in a discussion here that's kind of blowing my mind because, you know, you left off talking about an example you had of, of, of children talking about seeing a camel and on, on, on a door in a picture and putting it forward as if it's a, it's, it's, it's a real camel. Mm -hmm. And it could be a language thing as well, mm -hmm. right, that the child just use the language in that way and not mm. say it's a picture. But then when you talk about uh, another kid talking about having lions and tigers in St. Thomas because he knows that Channel 12 comes from St. Thomas, from Saint, <laughs> the, the Saint Tom, uh, mm -hmm. Saint Thomas uh, television station. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. Well, that, that, that drew to my mind when I go to the movies mm -hmm. and people in the movies are yelling at the characters and the actors and giving them instructions <laughs> as if they could actually change the script and change the action. Mm -hmm. Is it that, what, we don't know that this is not real, this is, is, is written, is, script, is acted, is produced, everything is made up, everything is directed, we don't know is we don't know that and we actually think that what's happening on television is real i think i think, um, I think adults mm -hmm. know for the most part but you just get caught up in the excitement of the drama you think so i i, I want to believe so mm -hmm. but the, the the thing is that like for example the instance with a child the one who thought that there were lions and tigers in saint thomas it shows that very often children a lot of stimuli a lot of things come at children and they don't have persons talking with them about things that they're seeing, things that they're experiencing. So mm -hmm. they make their own interpretation. And you might not necessarily know what that interpretation is until something happens or they say something. So there was this child, he was in my class, maybe a term, two terms, and I had no idea that he was thinking that because Channel 12 is broadcasted from St. Thomas, that everything he sees on Channel 12 is actually happening in St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, that's why it's important to have conversation with our children. And you're finding more and more, or less and less, conversation is taking place. Um, you have, if you notice, sometimes children going to school in a vehicle. Nowadays, every individual in the, in, the, in the vehicle at the back, one on the iPad, one on the Game Boy, everybody's doing their one own the thing. Phone, one texting. Right, one texting and, and yeah. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a lot of conversation going on that you had before. Mm -hmm. When you were growing up, all this entertainment wasn't there. So you had no choice but to talk. So you you talk know? each other. You spoke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is that doing to our young people? What is, it, what is that doing to our society? Well, I think it's isolating people from their culture and it's isolating or it's separating people from an awareness of or even a need to have awareness of where things come from, why they come from these places. Um, uh, there's just too much media coming at us. Uh, during the break I said to, to you that uh, I had read mm -hmm. that the modern man, the man of, of, the, of this century, 
is exposed to more stimulation in 24 hours than medieval man was exposed to in his entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. What that means is that we're being washed over by stimulation. Mm -hmm. What do we learn to, what do we pay attention to? What is important to pay attention to? Parental mediation is often controlling. I want you to look here. This is important. Pay attention to this. We're going to focus on this instead of all these other things. I want to give you an example that's happened yesterday and today in the, in the workshop because we are um, we're, we're bringing children in and we're working with them for uh, three days, uh, close to 12 hours of contact time. And um, a young man who I've been observing yesterday at every came in with a an iPad and was playing his games on the iPad mm. and every free moment he would turn to the iPad he didn't interact with us he didn't interact with interact with anybody else spontaneously but played on his iPad today he didn't play on the iPad Today, he sat at the table, and when he wasn't being engaged in a specific activity, he was listening to what we were saying. Mm -hmm. He was commenting on what we were saying. Okay. We brought him from this kind of isolation, you know, I'm not engaged in anything, I'm just playing with my iPad, to I'm interested in what's going on. I want to be engaged. I want to be involved. And we think that that's the consequence of mediated interaction. Uh, and we'll do it strategically, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, the needs that a child has, or even the needs that a parent has to have a child have an experience from a cultural perspective or from a functional perspective, we then make that the focus of the mediation and we draw, the, we engage the child in a very direct and meaningful encounter with the world. And we think that makes a very important difference for learning and for one's personality. How, uh, well, we, we, you know, it sounds like you're, you're talking about uh, children who you identify as, I don't know, when you say special needs, I'm, I'm thinking slow learners. Could be. Right? It, it, uh, 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 well, let me ask you the question then, instead mm -hmm. of assuming that I know what you're talking <laughs> about. Who are you targeting to practice the learning propensity assessment devices on? Okay, well, the device can be used with anyone. Okay? But are you, targeting, me, are, you, are you targeting anyone? Um, no, not in particular. You would, they will walk ready, more readily with the children who are presenting challenges. Those same children that they have concerns about whose needs they don't know how to meet. Mm -hmm. Okay, but just for the counselors themselves, and it was the same experience for me personally, when I first did the training, it brought an awareness to me of my personal strengths and weaknesses. And it put me in a better position to empathize with a child who isn't learning because there were things that when I, I was faced with in trying to learn it, I felt very intimidated because I'm thinking, well, here I'm a, a teacher, I have my master's degree, and I can't figure this out, mm -hmm. you know? And then it hit me, well, if I'm, as an adult, I'm feeling this way, imagine a child who's sitting in class, you know, on a daily basis. So one of the things when the counselor said, yes, they want to learn this process, I envisioned two things happening, one, them getting a new perspective for themselves on learning, how children learn, what are the different things that affect learning, but also developing skills that would help them to intervene with learning. And it's not necessarily always a child who you might consider slow or who might have um, some sort of um, syndrome or whatever that they might have been born with. It's also, also useful for gifted children because you have some children who sometimes you're so smart, even within the group that we were working with, at some of the adults, the counselors or teachers, there were some things that they can see right away because you're so quick. You can figure out that that's the answer. But then when you ask, you could explain how you got it. 
they can't explain the process mm -hmm. okay well this is this is the reason why that's the reason why i ask you because it seems to me that we need to do this assessment uh to, to all students and have this information available about all students at community education process how early can we do a lpda a lpad <laughs> uh we can begin to do this with uh, three and four year olds mm -hmm. but we can also work with uh, two and three year olds not to do a formal assessment but to do a an observation and an interaction with them which begins to show us their response to mediation their response to the interactions how important it is for parents to have this information we think it's quite important uh, but you have to start somewhere and uh, it, we do this work all over the world and we do this work with all with 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 people of all ages and for a, a very diverse range of reasons uh, and um, in some places the focus is on early intervention uh, in some places the focus is on vocational and um, occupational flexibility in some cases, it, in some places, it has to do with uh, meeting the needs of, spe of, of, of children who've been identified with special needs. Um, but I want to kind of broaden this a little bit. I want to broaden your question a little bit because um, Lorna said at, at the outset of this discussion that um, the theory of modifiability, the potential for all people to be modified in their basic behavioral and thinking and responsive structures has been confirmed by the brain sciences. Mm -hmm. There is a revolution occurring right now and it is, it is every much and perhaps more significant than the revolutions caused by Darwin's theory or by um, the, the discovery of celestial navigation. And it is that the brain is our most flexible and adaptive organ. Mm -hmm. and that we have learned and now there is very hard scientific evidence and it's mounting mm, as we speak <clears throat> that behavior shapes the brain just as much as the brain shapes behavior and that means that when we do these interventions at almost any level, age level, with almost any kind of disability or dysfunction, uh, we are in fact changing the structure of the brain. So even if the parents don't teach the child the things that's necessary to prepare them to learn in the classroom, mm -hmm when they get in the classroom classroom using these techniques mm -hmm. you could ch you can modify it's not too late it's, it's never too late, too late. Mm -hmm. you might have to work harder <clears throat> you might have to uh, pay attention to conditions i mean i don't think that uh, children who've been exposed to the horrors of darfur for example uh, are going to be easy to modify but they can be modified and that's, and that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about how, okay? Mm -hmm. What happens, what's the, what's the process? What are the instruments? We approach these modifications through what we've called as cognitive, which means thinking, how you think, and strategies of thinking, thinking skills. We present a task, an activity to the learner. The tasks have been chosen, specially selected to um, engage the learner in some kind of a process of learning. We observe how that learner responds to the task and then we teach. We modify. If you make a mistake, we help you overcome the mistake. If you solve the problem well, we ask you how you solved it. What did you do? How did you, what information did you use? We build cognitive functions. We overcome deficits or things that are fragile. And we slowly, slowly build up across a range of abilities that we know have to do with thinking and learning. Okay, all right, hold, hold right there, I gotta take a break. So you build up a range of 
activities. Activities that go across thinking and learning. That's right. Okay, I have to remember that. <laughs> so <laughs> when I come back, I don't have one of those senior moments. When I come back, maybe you could fix my brain too. I don't know. Is that something that right. you could, you could on modify? Li you on could, live television? I'm, yeah, but <laughs> modify so I don't have those senior moments. It is not like laying out of hands. No, oh, <laughs> it, it's some activities. I got to go through some process, right? We're going to take a break. We're going to come right back with more uh, Lorna Dawson and Dr. Felix right after these words from our sponsors. This program is sponsored by the law firm of J.S. Archibald & Co. and by the trust company J.S. Archibald Trust Services Limited, both of Rotown Tortola BVI. Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm having a very, very interesting and informative discussion here with Dr. Felix and teacher Lana Dawson about cognitive thinking and modifying learning uh, and, and the propensity to, to learn and to, to think. It's uh, quite interesting. And we left off talking about a series of activities mm -hmm. that assist in modifying behavior. Mm -hmm. So I want to continue that discussion and talk about those activities and how the whole, what are you teaching the counselors and the psychologists and the, the, the educators uh, here, in the, here in the Virgin Islands that would help them to assess the, the children and how does that, how does it work? Well, the, the LPAD, the Learning Propensity Assessment Device, and propensity really means the willingness and the availability of the learning. Mm -hmm. it's, we present small samples of activities. For instance, uh, we have a, a procedure called the organization of dots, where we show the learner two very simple geometric shapes, a square and a triangle. And then we show them a cloud of dots, and we tell them that if they connect these dots, they will, they will find the square and the triangle. But the, when, they, when they find the square and the triangle, it may be rotated in space, or it may be overlapped, and two dots may be very close together, and you have to decide which dot goes with the square, which dot goes with the triangle. So they have to plan they have to anticipate. They have to search systematically. They have to remember a strategy that they used. And while they're doing it, we are interacting with them. If they have difficulty, we show them how to solve the problem. If uh, they have solved the problem, uh, we help them to verbalize, to say why I saw the problem, why, how, I solved, how I solved the problem. And then we give them more tasks of a similar nature, but more complicated, more complex. And we watch them change their, their functioning as they learn. And as I said earlier, our theory is that your intelligence is really your ability to learn when you are taught in a systematic way. So some of the tasks are visual, some are motor, uh, some are verbal in the sense of, uh, some have to do with memory, some have to do with sequencing, uh, putting things in order. And this is based on uh, pretty widely accepted and widely understood dimensions of cognitive psychology, of how people learn. Um, and the difference between this kind of alternative assessment and traditional assessment has to do with the assumption that you can teach people to acquire new strategies and new skills uh, by giving them tasks which are, they relate to academics, but they're not academic. The content is more generic to gathering data. And uh, then, if we're in the teaching system that is based on this theory, then we actually begin to give them some content that is more specific, but still, how to develop 
strategies of thinking that help them organize their world, and then they can generalize it. They can go beyond the, see, nobody learns organization of dots just to find triangles and squares. Mm -hmm. But they learn organization of dots in order to then say, how would I deal with a problem in the world that I am, that I'm dealing with? Maybe a problem in the home or the family. How would I understand? The application of logic and reason. Exactly. Now, can you, can you show me, can you do one of those tests on me? <laughs> well, um, can, uh, you know, t can you I'll show you, I'll show you an example of, yeah, of what, yeah. um, mm -hmm. if I was in a workshop or if I was a, mm -hmm. a child mm -hmm. trying to, mm -hmm. well, having, to having challenges mm -hmm. learning and mm -hmm. didn't know how to learn, mm -hmm. what would you do? How could you to begin to modify my propensity to learn? Well. I brought a few materials. Okay, let's see. Um, there are three instruments that are based on social development, on thinking about our feelings, our thoughts and feelings. And I must tell you that we designed these for young children, for four and five and six year olds. And when we started showing them to, uh, when we started showing them to um, teachers and decision makers in social situations, they said, uh-uh, not just three, four, five, and six-year-olds. Our, our adolescents need them. Our, uh, our, our people who are incarcerated need them because people don't know how to think and deal with their feelings, deal with their, okay? But I'm expected to be embarrassing on uh, national no, television. No, not at all, not at all, <laughs> not at all. Uh, let me take one which is called, which is called, Think and learn to prevent violence. Now, I'm not sure how, um, how we'll be able to see this, but um, here are a there are a series of pages. There are a series of pages that show a situation at the top, a conflict situation. Mm -hmm. In this one, two children are fighting over a, a, a toy bear. And we want, we want you to assess the situation. What is going on here? Can you talk about it? Can you describe it? Okay, so that's the first thing I have to do. Is I have to say, well, you have the uh, one child sitting down, one child standing, the other one is pulling the bear's arm, the other one is holding the bear mm -hmm. around his waist, mm -hmm. and they're trying to get the bear from, okay. from each other. How do you think these guys feel? Uh, they're pretty angry. How can you tell? Well, the uh, expression on their faces. Aha. Uh -huh. Are there any other ways of telling how they are feeling? Um, that they're an activity of trying to mm -hmm. really physically mm -hmm. pull mm -hmm. the bear apart. Mm -hmm. We have a little bubble here, like in a cartoon. Yes. Um, what do you think this, this guy is saying in this encounter? Uh, I'm gonna kill you. Let it go. Okay. That belongs to me. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So now we have the situation. Mm -hmm. You've told a story. I've focused your attention on the details of the story. Now we go to the second level, and we have an alternative A and an alternative B. And in these alternatives, two different things are happening. Okay. What is happening in alternative A? What are you seeing? I'm seeing the one kid with a uh, toy car and the yeah. other kid with the bear. Okay. Mm. Why do you think that, the, that this boy is bringing the toy car? He wants to exchange a toy car for the bear. Okay. Look at the expressions on the children's faces. Okay, the one that's bringing a toy car is kind of smiling. The one that's, uh, that has the bear, he's still a little apprehensive. Okay, compare his facial expression here to his facial expression there. Well, he's a little less tense and uh, he's a okay. little calmer. All right. Can you make a hypothesis about the potential change in their relationship by the strategy of one boy offering an alternative toy. A hypothesis? Yeah. 
What do you think might that happen? That sounds like I got a jibber or a chicken <laughs> Anyway, what I think might happen. No. Okay, what might happen is that the one boy with the the the, the bear mm -hmm. might decide that he liked the truck better and decide to give the boy with the truck the bear and take the truck take the the, the car from the boy with the car. Reasonable. Mm -hmm. Look at alternative B. What's happening in alternative B? Uh, the situation seems to be getting worse. Okay, how can you tell? Well, now they stand in uh, the, the uh, increased horror on the face, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. actually the the one boy seems to be having more success in pulling it away from the other boy. Mm -hmm. Look at the bear. What's happening to the bear? The bear, poor bear, his arm is ripped off. It, the arm is, is bit off or torn off? Torn off, yes. Okay. okay. All right. Now, you are doing a lot of thinking here. I don't, uh, know, what, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I am, I am I I encouraging you to gather data, mm -hmm. to assess the situation, mm -hmm. to make some, um, come to some conclusions about what might be happening based on the data you're gathering. Okay. And now the question is, for this page, the question is, which consequence do you think is more likely based on the alternative A and alternative B? Because in the bottom row, mm -hmm. what do we see? Okay, I think, we, let me see. All right, you need to hold that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, in the bottom row now, an alternative A, Hold it up a little bit. Get it up like okay. this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, in the bottom, and in the, in the bottom of alternative A, which is the left-hand side, I'm mm -hmm. calling alternative A, um, because of the, the the other toy involved, mm -hmm. the one boy has gotten the bear in one piece, and he's smiling, and the other guy, the other kid, is has, has the toy car, and he's playing with the toy car, and he's smiling. Mm -hmm. And then an alternative B, the bear's arm, even though the other boy was successful in wrestling the bear away from the, the, other, the first child, the bear is torn apart and they're both angry and crying. Exactly. Thinking and learning to prevent violence. If you choose certain alternatives, mm -hmm. gather the data, make certain choices, certain outcomes are more likely to happen. Mm. Okay? Yes. If you choose other alternatives and gather the data, other outcomes are likely to happen. Okay. Now, you had a lot of skills that you employed to, um, to work to, on this to work problem. To work on this problem, yes. You knew that um, you could tell how people were feeling from the looking of their facial expressions. Mm -hmm. okay. You could, you knew that um, certain actions would lead to certain outcomes. We can ask the question, how and where did you learn that? So there was a lot of knowledge, a lot of thinking, a lot of reasoning being employed in the whole problem solving experience. That's right. Okay, where I learned yeah. that? Mm -hmm. From a whole variety of sources mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. that I can't remember. <laughs> no, and it's not important that you remember them, mm -hmm. but it is important that we create conditions in our life experience where people get that kind of information. Mm. And that goes back to what we were talking about a little earlier. You know, if you don't talk to your children, if you don't present situations that uh, give them an opportunity to analyze and predict and... Um, then they will never learn it. Exactly. Mm. And you can, you can go out on the street and you can interview adults and you can ask them about some of the basic things that they live with every day and they don't know where they come from and they don't know why they happen. Huh? Uh, there's a little joke. You know, the classic question about which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Huh? Right. So there's a little boy who says, I know which comes first. I know for sure. Mm -hmm. You do? You know which comes first, the chicken or the egg? He says, absolutely. I live the across the street from the supermarket. 
and the eggs are delivered at 6 o'clock in the morning, and the chickens are delivered at 7 o'clock in the morning. So I know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> How do we gather information about the world? This is the third step in a series where first we have children learn how to identify emotions. How can you tell how a person is feeling? And then how can you tell what situations are relevant, are, are meaningful for that kind of expression of emotion? Okay? Mm. As a series of learning experiences. Then we go to situations where you present a problem situation and you look at different ways of resolving that problem situation using empathy, the feeling I have about others. So there's some cleverly constructed activities which are based on identifying and working with the components of social, what we call social cognition learning about the world socially. When I talked about organization of dots, I was talking about perceptual organization. We can also talk about working with numbers, in number sequences. We can talk about, we can work with um, shapes and forms to uh, make analogies. This is to this as this is to that. So there are a variety of, of, of techniques, and Professor Feuerstein, my mentor and the person I now work for and with, developed these uh, strategies more than 50 years ago. But he developed them because they gave the opportunity to elicit, to bring up the positive modifiability potential in children and young adults who had been given up on because they were the survivors of very horrible experiences. We're gonna take a break. <laughs> take a, but but that was that was deep. I mean, I, I could see I could see in my mind what's happening. Uh, I could see a, a child learning how to learn. I could see a child learning how to think and changing their behavior, changing mm -hmm. their experiences, so that. Uh, it's easier to teach them, mm -hmm. and, exactly. And and, they, and 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 is that is that what we are calling intelligence? Yes. The development of that ability is Absolutely. intelligence. Absolutely. To to to, yeah. to figure things out and mm -hmm. to to learn and to mm -hmm. change and make choices in, in the correct with the, with the correct information. Thirty to forty years ago, it was commonly believed that the intelligence level you had at the age of about 17 or 18 was going to be it for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. People believe that. And that is, that is just no longer true. No longer true. Coming right back after these words from our sponsors, keep it glued right here to Spotlight. Spotlight is brought to you by the National Bank of the Virgin Islands, Totola Concrete Limited, Orion Law, Clarence Thomas Limited, Virgin Island Motors, and Bolo's Wholesale Cash and Carry. Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm sure I'm enjoying the conversation more than you. But it's, it's, it's really interesting. I'm fascinated by the whole thing and the, the little activity that I just went through really shed a lot on uh, how little I actually know. <laughs> but uh, I think it's, it's, this is really important stuff, really important information. If you if you got questions that uh, I got too caught up in the discussion to ask, uh, give us a call. The number's on the screen, 446-1949 to call and 442-5277 to text. So we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to have you engage in the discussion and find out a lot of things for yourself to help your children. Because that's really what this is all, this is all about. Okay, so we, we, get, we have these activities which are instruments to test your ability to actually learn. And once you have gotten that test, once you've done that test, what do you gather from the test? I, I want to say a, what you just said a little bit differently. Good. I want to say that the instruments provide an opportunity first to assess and then to teach. Okay. And then we look at the changes 
that occur from the teaching and we ask ourselves the question, what did we do to make those changes? And can we describe the, what we did to make those changes to other people so that they can do them in their classroom or in their home and family environment? It's designed to be very operational in the sense that, that uh, we're teaching our participants this week and last week how to take what they see, to pay attention to what they did to make the changes, to describe the changes in such a way that the teacher can look at those changes and say, ah, I can do that in the way I teach my reading. I can do that in the way I organize my classroom. And the parent can say, oh, if he can make that kind of change in this way, with this kind of intervention, I may be able to do the same thing uh, on simple activities like activities at the dinner table or going shopping in the supermarket and so on and so forth. So if, uh, if I'm in the classroom as a teacher mm -hmm. and I see a, a, a child exhibiting a certain behavior, I could say, well, if I did, here is, this, this is an intervention. I can do this to the child right now mm -hmm. and have the child's behavior change. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. It amazes me how often teachers who have, uh, let me say it positively, it amazes me how often teachers, when they see the results of a dynamic assessment, when they see the results of the mediation and the changes that occurred because of the mediation, they very spontaneously recognize uh, changes they can make in the way they are presenting their curriculum. Mm -hmm. But is, is, is this, um, what is it, a, a one-week workshop? Or two weeks. A two-week workshop? Mm -hmm. Is this enough no. training? No. So at what level now would our teachers be trained from this work, from your workshop? They are going to have to go out and practice. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to certify their uh, competency for this two weeks until they give us some evidence of their practicing. So sometime in the next uh, two to three weeks, two to three months, we hope it's not more than a few months, while, because we want it to still be fresh, they will assess some children or some young adults or even some older adults. And they'll send us the reports. We will review the reports. We will give them comments about strengths and weaknesses and things they missed or things that they did well. And then we'll give them the diploma. But there is a second level of training. Okay. So there's potentially another two weeks that should come at some point in the future after they have assimilated what they've learned this week, in this two weeks, and done some practicing. What great teachers are uh, they taking the sem at the workshop, or participating in the workshop? We have all our counselors, our school mm -hmm. counselors. We also have um, a speech and language pathologist and an assistant. We have a school counselor and a educational psych a school psychologist, or educational psychologist, and then there are some class regular classroom teachers as well as teachers who teach in special education. Uh, what grade do the teachers teach? What you have? Oh, what grades mm -hmm. they teach? Yeah. Um, all ranges Primary we school, have. We have school. persons from the teachers from the BVI TVI. We have teachers from primary school, and we don't have specific teachers from high school. We have counselors from the high school. Okay. And then how big, how, how big, uh, how many uh, people? Persons. Persons. Um, 28, 28, 28 persons, yeah. Any uh, train of trainers, for lack of a better term? <laughs> Well, um, interesting you should ask that because just today I was discussing with Lou a number of persons over the years, from the first time it was introduced, a number of us have been doing training. Mm -hmm. I'm actually at a level now where I am eligible to work on trainer of trainers. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you have, we have to do some a certain amount of teaching of the intervention. I've not really completed it, but I'm going to be writing a letter to see if I could get some sort of exemption to continue with the training, you know, of the teachers. I'll have to do it under supervision. Then we have um, the teachers at SN Henry Rishi Learning Center. Two of them have training in the basic. Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Two of them have training in the basic. Thank you for calling Spotlight. Right ahead, please. Thank you for calling Spotlight. Speak! <laughs> Carla? Carla, I can hear you. Okay. 
I don't, I don't know what's happening there. I don't know if the phones are acting up again or what, but maybe we could get it sorted out. And if you, if you haven't been able to get through calling me, please text, because I really want to hear from you. I want to hear your concerns, and I'd like to have Dr. Falik or Teacher Dawson to answer your, answer your concerns, answer your questions. So either text me if you can't get through on the phone, or try to get you on the phone again. Okay, yes. so we have um, at the school they are using the Instrumental Enrichment Basic, which is the intervention program for young children or persons with special needs, with deficiencies in their thinking. So we have two teachers who already, who've already had training in that and they're leading the teaching at that school. And so I was asking Luel, what is the next step? Because we rec recognize that our parents need to be the focus, some of the focus of our attention. So he said, well, with Hodge, their training, one of them can now take a course as a trainer, learn to be a trainer. Yeah, a trainer. Thank you for calling the spotlight. Right ahead, please. Thank you for calling the spotlight. I don't understand. Okay. Uh, please text me. The, the, the text number is on the screen. That it's going to come up in a minute. Yeah. So, so, so please text me or with your question, and I'll read it out, and we'll try to to get an answer. I don't know what what the problem is with the form. So, you, you're going to get um, some yes. teachers so, uh -huh. who are certified to. Train. train okay so that particular teacher from the school said mm -hmm. well she's more interested in working with parents so we'd be looking at channeling her in that direction mm -hmm. another teacher she's already signed up to do the assessment she actually signed up to do the assessment for the younger children or children who are low functioning because of the population she's working with but the prerequisites for doing that course was actually this assessment program that we're doing now so now that she's completed this she would actually be able during the summer to do the assessment for younger children what, what was your training I, I, what, what did you have to go through to become what you are I mean, well not not all your life training, but <laughs> <laughs> after the point which you got your perhaps your bachelor's or master's mm -hmm. and you wanted to go into this, what, mm -hmm. what 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 was your training to make you? Um, My first professional experience was as a school psychologist, mm -hmm. and I had the very good fortune of working under the direction of a very internationally known psychologist who um, taught us very well. Hold on a second. Thank you for calling the spotlight. Hello. Yes, there you go. Go right ahead, please. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah man. I think that's a uh, nice program, you know? Thanks. Look at you. I have some of the other questions. He's so smart. He's so brilliant. Who's working like that? The car's right. And I get the proper common sense. I'll probably turn around right now because you don't mention the word common sense, but it's all about common sense. Mm -hmm. I, 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 uh, yes, my brother. Basically, basically. Let, let, you, want, you want to get a, resp uh, a reaction to, you, to your comment? Yeah, okay, yeah, All right. Thank you very much for the call. I appreciate it. Yeah. Is, is that what we call common sense? To some extent, yes. Um, we think common sense has two parts. Mm -hmm. One is um, being able to read situations, to understand situations accurately, to, um, to, to, to know what's going on. So we call that social awareness. Mm -hmm. But then, the second part of common sense is, being, is acting appropriately. And we call that social competence. Mm. And that takes, both of those take skills. The, um, and many of those skills occur as part of developmental experience. But when new situations occur and new, new, new challenges occur or when uh, crises happen, then it, 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 it stresses us. So common sense is a, is, a, is, a, is a function of those two things I've been talking about. Awareness and uh, appropriate action. Okay, I want to get back 
to the, to, and where I'm going with the question actually, so that we could get right to it. Do you need to be, is, is this advanced psychology, do you need to be a psychologist in order to go now and study for, uh, for, first time? First time. No, yeah. first time? You do not. You, you do not, because the first training that I, well, the second training that I went on, the first one was just an awareness session when I heard about it. Mm -hmm. But the second training that I went on, a lot of the persons who were in the group that I was in, they became aware of it because most of them were special education teachers. They had children in their class for whom the parents felt that they were not making a difference. Yes, they had sort of plateaued, just reached a certain level and weren't going any further. And the parents kept seeking for answers, trying to find, I think my child can go further than this. And they came across for his science work. So as parents, just regular parents, no teachers or mm -hmm. anything, they went and they took the training. Okay. And so they learned how to mediate with their children, they learned how to, you know, they had the assessment, they learned how to work with their children. And then the teachers began seeing changes within the children in their classroom and they started it quite well. What's happening with this child? He's acting differently, he's, you know, he's performing differently. Mm -hmm. And teachers began to learn. So you don't have to be uh, so how, how, how many teachers we have who have this train? Um, and when you finish, when you finish with the the twenty eight, mm -hmm. they would have a certain level of competency. Right. But would that comp that level of competency comp competency be enough to make a significant difference in the lives of the children and the turn and a modification of their propensity to learn? A difference in the children that they interact with, I would hope. Which would be early, early childhood or primary school. What, whatever level they're at. The uh -oh. children in their own homes, mm -hmm. the children in their families, children that they meet, you know, in whatever situation, mm -hmm. along with the children that they interact with at work. Because once you begin to be become aware of these things, you'd sort of, when you interact with children, you question them differently. Let me give you an example. Um, one day I was driving home with a child and we drove through a gut. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon, the sun was still shining. We drove through a gut. So before we went through sun shining, then we went up through the gut, it was quite dark. And when we came out on the other side, the child exclaimed, look how quick morning come. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Now because of my background in this here, I began to question her. And to get her to see, well, okay, well, why did, why did you say that? What time was it when we went home? Where did we just come? We just left from town, we are on our way home, it was after four, okay. When you get home, does morning come right away? Then we got in fact, well, you have afternoon, evening, you're going to night and then morning. Mm -hmm. Do you think morning could have come between the time that we drew from this side of the gut to the other side? So what happened? What caused the change in the light and that sort of thing? And because of my awareness of this, another time a parent might have just said, girl, what's stupidness you're talking and you just move mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And you didn't stop, you won't stop to think, well, maybe this child has an issue with understanding standing time. So coming out of that, now I ask the parents, well, how is she doing in school with her maths? And she's having trouble with time. Mm. Okay? Okay, so yeah, so I, 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 see, I see how that would work. The, the other question is how to create a systematic approach to using this information and to making it work across the board. I mean, how, how well, Politically, how is the minister responding to this? What, what is his views on what you're doing? Have you spoken to him or you just went off on your own? And he <laughs> no, no, the I first time he's seen it, now it's on television, right? <laughs> no, it's not the first how, time. How do you go into the cash box to get the money to do this to if do, you don't talk to, to the, the minister, minister, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So he, he is aware, um, probably might not be fully aware of all the implications, but I have shared with him what we've done so far mm -hmm. and the direction that I think we can go. And I think he's fully in support of it. Um, he, he speaks a lot of inclusion and it is actually one of the vehicles that many countries along the world is using to help facilitate the process of inclusion. Okay. And it seems to me that, and we, we fall on a 30 o'clock shortly, but it seems to me that this is really bigger than just intervention for children with special needs. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. And are we prepared to go the distance uh, with this 
this this well these instruments I am prepared mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're hoping with this sort of exposure that more people will be coming on board. You know, we met with parents. Um, the purpose was the assessment, the training for teachers and counselors. But in my communication with Dr. Fali, he also indicated, well, while I'm here, I'm willing in the evening to meet with whomever. And we actually had a parent who was trained in this approach and has been using it with a child, and so she recommended. So we've had two meetings thus far with parents. Okay, thank you for calling the spotlight. Where the hip, please. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. I think what Mr. Gwen is a brilliant idea because you see, most people don't have no time to teach them children a lot of stuff like what needed right now. And what you're doing is really, really brilliant. So, the families are up on that thing, you know? Thank you. Yeah, that's my brother. Thanks a lot for that call. Well, that's another issue mm -hmm. that with the new culture, Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I and I have to start calling it for what it is. <laughs> it is a new culture. Mm -hmm. It's a culture that's been passed down to us through the media, mm -hmm. particularly television, and the development, the economic activity in the country where you know you either have to work two jobs to feed your children, so you neglect your children to feed them. Mm -hmm. or you work two jobs because you want to keep up with the Joneses mm -hmm. or both parents work two jobs to make ends meet or both parents work two jobs to keep up with the Joneses whatever the causes are mm -hmm. the fact remains that we have begun to neglect each other mm -hmm. as human beings mm -hmm. right so how, you know, how are we going to well, how are we going to get to the adults? How we, how, how, you know, you said um, one of the teachers wanted to work with the parents. How are we going to get to the parents? How are we going to get to the adults? Because it seems to me that's a central part of the challenge. Let's go to the phone. Thank you very much for calling Spotlight. Right ahead, please. Good night. Good night. Excellent program, as usual. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, as a result of watching and listening to the your guests and uh, yourself and the managers of the, of the questions and answers. Talk a little louder. Thinking, I'm thinking uh, that, uh, for example, at Christmas time we say, <clears throat> Merry Christmas and uh, prosperous New Year. And then the, we hear the government saying that they are concerned about crime and uh, the violations of the, 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 the code of law. And, and we have such problems with uh, poverty and people being poor. Now, having gone to school and getting the education, the so-called education and degrees, uh, our people uh, are not aware uh, that the big objective is to become prosperous and have a prosperous uh, New Year, a good New Year, to know our natural resources and uh, the, the, our, our raw materials available. And as an African people, gold, diamonds, uh, uranium, oil, how is it that uh, knowing or supposedly being exposed to this information, this knowledge, uh, and being taught wisdom by the spiritual people, how is it that black people are the poorest people in the world? Being the poorest people in the world, they are the, the, the most likely to be sick and uh, not eating properly or not knowing how to eat or what foods to eat. How is it that we're so poor, uh, and yet this information is supposed to be made available to us, that we are, Africa is the richest country in the poor earth. All right, let me get a response to that uh, comment, Carl, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the call. Okay. My feeling is that while poverty is uh, a condition that might prevent the uh, transmission of the culture and the mediation of the culture and the relationships between parents and children, poverty isn't the, isn't the, the final answer. 
there are many very poor families that still hold to the importance of teaching their children and doing the rituals and so on and so forth. By the same token, being wealthy and being prosperous, we see many, many families where children are surrounded by objects, surrounded by things, but there's still no... They're missing the interaction. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. The interaction yeah. is what's important. That's right. Not necessarily mm -hmm. your station mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have the, the, the knowledge, the education mm -hmm. to talk about deep psychological mm -hmm. issues or even talk to mm -hmm. your child about uh, the flowers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. as long as you're having mm -hmm. that relationship on a human level, mm -hmm. that is, that's a significant help. Professor Feuerstein uses a coda, a, mm -hmm. a kind of a, a way of thinking. He says that cognitive modifiability first requires a need. I need to have my children learn. I need to have people fulfill their destiny. If you have a need, you will then have a belief. You'll believe it's possible. Mm -hmm. If you have a belief, you will then fight for the changes that can be made. And you will seek the, pro the possibilities in the environment and in the family and in the culture. Need, belief, and then action toward it. Thank you very much. You want to have the last one, or you want to leave that? Let that be the last word. Let that be the last. Let word. that be the last word. Cool. I want to thank you both for being my guests on it's Spotlight. A, thank you very much, Dr. Fali. It's a privilege to be here. It's thank really you. a pleasure, and it's always good to see you, my sister. Thank you. Uh, we need to get this thing. Need to be bigger than what than what it is. You know, we need to send. Is it, so where is the university where? you know, persons with this information are and they are trained? It's all over the world. It's okay. all over the world. We have groups of universities in, in many, many countries. We have an international center in Jerusalem. And like the Bible says, let the word go forth from Jerusalem. Well, we need to get some of the word. And we don't have any, you have, we have what this setup is, what it's called like training centers, which mm -hmm. take on responsibility mm -hmm. for training people in a particular region. Mm -hmm. The Caribbean doesn't have. From time I learned this, I said, my goal is to have us to have the first one here within the Caribbean. So, so we walk in. So how it. long would it take, like what, a four year program to be really, Good at this thing. Mm, two or three years. Three, two or three uh, but years. remember, there's a there's already a an almost ten year history of the first seeds being planted. Okay. Um, I want a manufacturing plant. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I want to I want to get one of the plants here yeah. and start manufacturing teachers and personnel mm -hmm. who are yeah. going to be our, bringing this thing to the public. Our international institute's goal is always mm -hmm. to create the conditions on the ground so that people become indigenous at it. Do it. Yes. And so we can start those those processes going and we need connecting dedicated people like Lorna Dawson and others in the community who we are t touching their lives. I wish you were at a parents meeting we had last night to see the excitement in parents as we worked with young children. But I, I, I mean I could imagine I, I think it, uh, it's a fantastic idea and you know you have my support in you could come on <laughs> wherever I am anytime and talk and say what you got to say and I'll, get, I'll go behind the scenes and fight with you because, right. I mean, looking at this, this is really what we need to, to make a serious, uh, make serious progress in, in our education process. Right. Yeah. Cause I, I actually had gotten to the point where the same Dr. Kinnard earlier, uh, sometime late last year, you know, we were speaking because I still keep in touch with them and he said, Lana, if they're not, the community isn't buying into it with you, you need to go out on your own. So I was basically, it's, you know, started that I was planning to branch out on my own when I retire, which I hope to be the next four years or so. Yeah. But for me, I would have liked to see it, you know, well into the system, be system before I go. Um, I think we got a minister who... Yes, so that's um, why I say now, so... Um, maybe, maybe you have bought in and right. put his, and put his I, I haven't had a chance to really sit down with him and say to him, because for example, I've noted, and I've, I've submitted it in writing before, um, there's an area in Brazil called Bahia, mm -hmm. 
where they have done a large scale implementation. I think it's probably the largest, largest one we've done. Largest implementation that has been done. We trained 600,000 600, children. Go. The governor mm -hmm. got interested, okay? And he sent a set of teachers in Scotland. They had large scale. Somebody at that level got interested. So I'm trying to get minister. Somebody at that level is right. Yeah, they're, yelling at, they're yelling at me. <laughs> yeah. Next week, the spotlight will be on the pharmaceutical industry, the dangers of counterfeit medicines, the importance of taking medication as prescribed, and the impact new strains of viruses may have on our health. So be sure to be here with Spotlight on JTV Channel 55. Tuesdays live at 8 p.m. and rebroadcast at 2.30 on Sunday afternoons. You can also catch up with all the Spotlight programs on JTV, jtvlive.net at any time. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your words of encouragement. Don't forget to email me at jtvspotlight at yahoo.com. I'm at your anchor reminding you that when the Spotlight is on, you see the facts. Peace and blessings. This program is sponsored by the law firm of J.S. Archibald and Co. and by the trust company J.S. Archibald Trust Services Limited, both of Rotown Tortola BVI.